Hello once again, AP Calculus students. Mr. Record here from Avon High School, and we're going to look at our introductory video over topic 1.5. It's called Determining Limits Using Algebraic Properties. Sometimes we like to refer to this topic as those really, really tricky limits. And, and that's what I want to make the focus of this video. And all of these limits that we're gonna be finding over the course of this video and a few that follow are going to revolve around some very, very special properties. And those properties look just like this. So let me get my camera sort of down here and out of the way and let's take a look at those guys up there, right? So the properties of these limits that we're talking about will begin with this notion that we're going to let B and C be real numbers and let N be a positive integer. And so essentially what's going to happen is that we're going to let X approach these values that we're talking about. Maybe having X approach B or having, in this case, uh, X is going to approach C. I don't think we're going to use B in uh, the case of this particular uh, example with the limit. Also let F and G be functions such that the limit of F of X as X approaches C is going to be capital L and the limit of G of X as X approaches C is going to be K. So let's highlight those things. We, we have this very important fact here in yellow and we have this very important fact in green. Nothing is going to change the fact that those two limits are going to be L and K respectively. L and K are just some real numbers. Now, we have these five properties, like I uh, mentioned. The first one is the scalar multiple. This is actually where the B comes into place. Let's say that there's this stray constant B out in front of your function. Well, that constant isn't going to play a huge role in finding the limit. You're basically going to be able to push that limit through, let it take hold of the f of x, and find that limit, which we knew to be L, and then just make sure that your B that was the constant multiplies by that limit. It's that simple. The scalar multiple idea is not really the tricky part about this particular series of limits. Now the sum and difference property. If you had never seen these properties before, you probably would think very intuitively that the sum and difference property works. And that's a it's certainly the case. If limit is, uh, is, uh, of x is going to approach c here, and we're going to take f of x and g of x and either add or subtract them, then all that we need to do is add or subtract their corresponding limits, whichever operation that we saw in the original problem. Pretty straightforward. Looking at the product uh, uh, property, nothing is really different. The limit as x approaches c of f of x times g of x is just going to be the product of l and k multiplied together, just as we would have expected. And if I go one more case with the quotient property, the limit of f of x divided by g of x as x approaches c is indeed going to be the limit of the f divided by the limit of the k, uh, or the limit of the g, which is k. Now, I probably should put a little caveat here because this is a little bit implied that k cannot be zero because we're going to have a whole bunch of problems on our hands if that's the case. Now, on the surface, those three rules don't seem very tricky. But if you read the note over there in blue, it cannot be emphasized enough that those limit properties that you see to the left will not apply if either or both the limit of f of x and the limit of g of x fail to exist. Think about it. We're going to have a really difficult time adding or subtracting or multiplying or dividing does not exist, right? We don't know what does not exist plus 2 is. We don't know what does not exist times 4 is. And so that doesn't mean that the limit's going to fail to exist necessarily. It just means that we're going to have to work a little bit harder. And that's when the idea of these limits using these algebraic properties can become just a little bit more difficult. Now, before we go on, looking at the power property, it is going to work very, very similarly. You don't see this one quite as often. But let's say you're going to take the limit as x approaches c of some function that's raised to virtually any exponent. Now those m and n's that we talked about here um, are, are, are going to 
both be some kind of, let's say, a positive integer in this case to, to make things kind of simple. And then when we resolve this limit, we basically have the L that we would get for the limit of f of x raised to that same power. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at one example and put this into practice. All right, so up above here it says consider the graphs of the functions f of x and g of x that are given below. We want to find the following limits by using a pair of one-sided limits when necessary. Well, boy, that's new. Where does this notion of the one-sided limit come in? Well, let's take a look. So if we look at our example A, the only one that we'll do in this video, we're asked to find the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x times g of x. Now, what normally one would think to do here is say, well, hey, we have a property for this, right? Why don't we just go ahead and rip this expression apart and rewrite it as the product of two limits? And it is certainly acceptable to approach the problem this way initially. But remember, if one or both of these limits produces a does not exist, then we're going to have to rethink things. And lo and behold, it does not take long for us to determine that the limit of f of x, which is the graph here on the left, as x approaches 3, is indeed going to give us a non-existent answer, right? We seem to approach two different values of y from either side. Now, if by some chance you didn't see that, maybe you were thinking that this limit is equal to 2, which is a very common misconception, you might want to go back and look at some of the basic videos over how to find limits graphically and then return to this video. But I hope I have you all convinced that the limit of f of x as x approaches 3 does not exist. Okay, It doesn't even matter what the limit of the g of x is as x approaches 3, although it does exist, but we're going to have to revert to something a little bit different here. And so what we're going to do is approach this using the one-sided limit idea. And so we will take this 3 that is our target, and we're going to approach that 3 only from the left side. Now, if we were to do that, we were definitely going to get an answer for the f of x limit. As x approaches 3 from the left, it looks like the y values are gradually getting closer and closer to 1. OK, well, that's better. And then over here with the g of x, we see that as x gets closer and closer to 3 from the left, the y value gets closer and closer to 0. Now, because neither 1 nor 0 is an undefined or does not exist value, we can go ahead and multiply them together, and we would get 0, and that would be the answer to our left-sided limit. But we're only halfway done, right? We will need to do the same exact thing, approach this problem the same way, but let x approach 3 from the right of our f of x and of our g of x. One bad thing about these is that students do get a little bit sort of down in the dumps that you've got to write a little bit more whenever you're trying to solve these really tricky limit problems. So you need to show the two one-sided limit approaches. So for the limit of f of x as x approaches 3 from the right, we find that we approach a y value up here of positive 3. Hopefully you all see that okay. And then back over here to the g of x function as x approaches 3 only from the right, we tend to arrive at that same destination value of 0. Of course, 3 times 0 is also 0. And now we can take a step back and we can think, huh, wait a minute now. Wait a minute. We have two one-sided limits that are the same. What does that mean? Well, what that means is that the limit of your original problem as x approaches 3 from both sides is going to take on that value of 0. Remember, if your two one-sided limits are in agreement with each other, that would mean that your final answer is going to be equal to 0. Now, I don't want to just stop the video right here. I, I want to kind of go on and just show you some really cool visual evidence of, of what it is that we've just determined. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to switch over to my graphing calculator here. And I'm going to have to kind of adjust the window here 
maybe a little bit, maybe move the camera up to here. And again, I'm, I'm just using the TI Inspire graphing calculator, nothing, uh, you know, uh, that, that some of you may not have at your disposal. Or if you happen to have the TI-84, you could also replicate the same thing, and I'll show you how. But what I've done here on this first page is I've basically graphed that original f of x function. Now, to show you that f of x, it's going to be quite daunting. If I double click here, you're going to see, oh my gosh, this wicked six piece, I believe, piecewise function that extends from the domain of negative two all the way up to positive eight that uh, I basically put together on my own uh, in developing this particular problem. Now, I've gone ahead on another page and I've developed a piecewise function for our g of x function. Right. Now, it's not quite as bad. It only has four pieces, but it was pretty rough to come up with this last piece uh, to have that horizontal asymptote of two. So we have our f of x, we have our g of x. Now, notice that the f of x back in page 1.1 one, one is denoted by my f1 of x. That's going to be important here in a second. And my g of x is going to be denoted by f2 of x. Okay. Now let's kind of go back here and say for those of you that are using the TI Inspire, like, well, gosh, how did he get all these really cool graphs? Well, you just bring up your you, you your template that will allow you to graph a piecewise function, which is right here. And in on the TI Inspire, you can choose um, six pieces very, very easily. Now, unfortunately, for those of you that were uh, using the TI-84, I think you, your maximum allottage for pieces in your piecewise function is five. Um, so for whatever it's worth for this particular problem, you wouldn't really need the piece over here for your for your f of x. So you could probably just eliminate this since none of the action has really taken place over here with x is equal to zero. Okay, and then for the TI Inspire users, don't pay much attention to why I have these open circles and closed circles to mimic my graph. They do mimic the graph, of course. They do a pretty good job of it, as you can see, but those are not going to have any bearing on the actual result of the graph that I'm about to produce. So here we go. We're going to go into a brand new graphing page, and I am simply going to pull up a graph template, and I'm going to graph f of x, which remember was f1, I don't have to shout there, so f1 of x multiplied by f2 of x. Now that would be f times g. Now it's a very wicked looking piecewise function graph, uh, as you can see, but if we go in and we look at x equaling 3, which is what our target was, and if x were a, to approach 3 from both sides, I think it's pretty clear that the y value, whoop, the y value right there is definitely going to be zero. So hopefully this helped out. We're going to spend a little bit more time going over part B and part uh, C and even part D of this problem uh, in a future video, but at least this gets kind of your feet wet with how to deal with some of these tricky limits. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.